G'day and salutations, and Happy New Year, as this is my first briefing of 2026. Today's briefing, China's military power. We'll look at some of the key developments in the PLA in 2025, and touch on the US Department of Defense's 2025 report to Congress on military and security developments involving the People's Republic of China. Some of these developments were seen for the first time in 2025, while others have entered service during the year. I can't cover all developments, just the ones I think are most significant at this time. If I'm missing any important developments, please let me know in the comments below. In order, I'll cover the Navy, Air Force, ground vehicles, nuclear capabilities, and finally, significant developments in space launches. I'll conclude with some developments we might see in 2026. In terms of the Navy, the most significant development has been what is almost certainly the early stages of construction of China's first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier at Dalian, the Type 004. What leads us to this assessment is the installation of what appears to be two reactor containment structures on a large hull being constructed at the same yard as China's first two aircraft carriers. The CVN will build upon China's first Katabar conventional carrier, the Type 003, aka Plans 18 Fujian, which has now been commissioned. In time, this will become the most capable aircraft carrier outside of the US Navy. Let's see separate briefing linked below. The Fujian's carrier air wing will include the KJ600 Airborne Early Warning and Control Aircraft, which is a critical force enabler for carrier air wings. The J35 5th generation stealth strike fighter, primarily carrying its weapons internally, providing the Navy Air Force with a capability only matched by the F-35C, which is only operated by the US Navy, and which is only operational off three of its carriers. And the J-15T, 4.5 generation long-range strike fighter electronic warfare aircraft, which is already operating off China's two Stobar carriers, and which will complement the J-35s by carrying larger weapons externally for air, land and sea targets. All these aircraft were shown during the 2025 Victory Day Parade. A likely additional component of the air wing is the GJ-21 displayed at the parade. A stealthy UKEV with folding wings, the GJ-21 is designed primarily for strike missions as well as performing intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance ISR, tasks. The GJ-21 will almost certainly also operate off the Type 076 assault carrier. Arguably the most interesting development in the plan in 2025 has been the sea trials of Plans 51 Sichuan, what I call a landing carrier assault or an assault carrier, an amphibious assault ship yet uniquely equipped with electromagnetic catapults to launch fixed wing aircraft and recover them by arrest of wires. A sea separate briefing link below. Another addition to the plan's amphibious capability was the commissioning of the fourth Type 075 LHD Plans 34 Hubei. 2025 also saw continued enhancement to the planned surface combat fleet with continued construction of destroyers, the most capable of which are the Type 055s, with nine in service and another five in various stages of construction. These were joined by even more of the Type 052 Delta family air warfare destroyers, with 33 in service and an additional five in various stages of construction. Supporting the destroyers are the frigates, with the two Type 054 Bravo frigates having been commissioned. It is interesting that despite this newer design, the plan continues to build the older Type 054 Alpha frigate. These new builds are the Type 054 Alpha Modified. These feature an enlarged hangar and extended flight deck for Z20 helicopter operations, and a 100mm main gun replacing the earlier 76mm model thereby offering the same armament as the Type 054 Bravos. There is a total of 44 in service, with another 6 in various stages of construction. Ensuring these service ships can stay operationally longer and farther away require underway replenishment ships, or AORs. Significantly, the plan is adding additional Type 903 Alphas, with two more undergoing sea trials and a further three in various stages of construction to add to the seven already in service. Interestingly, we are yet to see more of the larger and more capable Type 901 large, fast, underway replenishment ships under construction. 
Moving to submarines, two new Type 093 SSNs have entered service, with possibly another eight in various stages of construction, although some of these might be the new Type 095s. However, no more Type 094 SSBNs uh, have been confirmed as under construction. Perhaps the PLA is moving towards the construction of its successor, the Type 906. In terms of conventional submarines, no additional Type 093 Charlies have been identified as under construction. However, the Type 41 has been launched and is fitting out. At approximately 87 metres in length and 9 metres wide, it is equipped with an X-shaped rudder and pump jet propulsion, and is highly likely to be a hybrid conventional nuclear submarine. Possibly the beginning of a new type of vessel, or maybe only a concept demonstrator, is a semi-submersible trimaran. The vessel is around 65 metres or 213 feet long, with two likely pump jets mounted on outriggers, and may be either crewed or unmanned. It has a submarine-like sail which is fitted with a snorkel and possibly an antenna mast. Its purpose might be as a semi-submersible arsenal ship. This might be complemented by commercial vessels armed with container-launched land attack missiles, what I call a commercial arsenal ship, potentially armed with as many as 60 VLS cells, or some of these cells together with the ability to launch UCAVs in a style reminiscent of the British World War II CAM ships or catapult aircraft merchantmen, however more likely for strike missions than localised air defence. And finally for the Navy, the plan added an additional hospital ship, a third type 920 class, the auspicious ARC, joining the Silk Road ARC and the Peace ARC, which have peacetime and wartime roles. Moving to the Air Force, the 6th generation JXDS continues flight testing with no substantial physical changes. This is not the case with the other 6th generation prototype, the J36, with the second prototype exhibiting three notable changes. One is that the first aircraft had nozzles recessed into the top of the fuselage. The new prototype features three angled exhaust nozzles similar to the two-dimensional thrust vectoring nozzles of the F-22. Second is the change to the lower inlets. On the new prototype, divertless supersonic inlet intakes take the place of the original ones, reducing weight and complexity while improving stealth. The third change, the J36 tandem two-wheeled main landing gear has changed to a twin-wheel side-by-side arrangement. While the sixth generation aircraft are undergoing flight testing, new fifth generation aircraft have vented service. The J-35 is now in low-rate initial production and has achieved initial operational capability. While we don't yet know its exact dimensions, rough figures suggest a length of 18 metres or 59 feet, a wingspan of 11.5 metres or 38 feet, and a maximum takeoff weight of around 32 tonnes. So it is larger than the F-35A and roughly the size of an F-A-18EF, but being a stealth aircraft with internal weapons bay. The other key development regarding fifth generation aircraft is the introduction into service of the two-seat J-20S, the only two-seat stealth fighter to have been developed. Supporting the fifth generation manned aircraft are another four UCAVs, two with vertical stabilisers and the broad appearance of fifth generation stealth aircraft, and two without vertical stabilisers, reminiscent of sixth generation fighter aircraft. The smaller ones are likely collaborative combat aircraft, for strike and ISR missions, or the larger ones, around the same size as a manned J-10 single-seat fighter, are likely a fighter-like loyal wingman and possibly capable of independent operation. A critical force enabler for all these fast jet aircraft are Airborne Early Warning and Control Aircraft, AEWNC, with the latest addition coming in the form of the KJ-3000, a flying prototype of which was seen at the end of the year. Based on the improved Y-20B tanker transport airframe with domestic engines, this AEWNC aircraft will bring increased capability over the existing KJ-2000, which is based on the Aleutian IL-76 airframe. Note the KJ-3000 has a rotating dome as opposed to the fixed dome on the KJ-2000. And finally for the Air Force, the first images of a new transport aircraft, 
possibly designated Y15 have appeared. With a suggested payload of 30 tonnes, it fits just above the Y9 with a payload of 25 tonnes and around half that of the Y20's payload of 66 tonnes. Equipped with four turboprop engines, a high T-tail offering improved high-speed performance and higher clearance space for rear cargo doors, a straight wing, which excels at low speeds and offers better lift and efficiency, and winglets, primarily to reduce induced drag, leading to improved fuel efficiency, extended range, better climb performance, and sometimes increased payload capacity. Moving to ground vehicles, the most conspicuous was the new tank, the as yet unconfirmed ZTZ. The new tank is lighter than the PLA's current premier tank, the ZTZ-99, perhaps weighing in the 40 to 45 tonne range. It has an unmanned turret with three crew and hull and modular add-on armour. An obvious feature is the 105mm gun with faceted casing on the barrel. Other notable features on the turret include an active protection system with sensors to identify top attack munitions and smoke grenade launchers covering top attack threats. Complementing the new tank is what I call a fires support vehicle with a focus on supporting non-line of sight engagements. This FSV has a remote control turret with no anti-tank guided missiles and an APS system including sensors to attack top attack munitions. This vehicle is also equipped with an ISR and targeting drone capability. The other new armoured vehicles on display support the PLA Air Force's airborne troops. The first is the airborne fire support vehicle. It has a remote control turret with two anti-tank guided missiles and four likely unguided rockets that might be used in a similar manner to those found on the PLA's assault breacher vehicles. This FSV is joined by an APC version. Based on the same chassis as the FSV, it will be able to carry more infantry than it and will be better protected than the ZBD-03 it replaces. The airborne APC is armed with a 12.7mm machine gun and 35mm grenade launcher combination, two anti-tank guided missiles and carries a full dismount section or squad. And finally, there is a further vehicle based on the same chassis in the form of the new airborne self-propelled 120mm mortar, providing critical organic direct and indirect fire support to airborne forces. If the new Y-15 can carry two and the Y-23 of the new airborne armoured vehicles, which in themselves offer better capabilities and better protection than their predecessors, the airborne forces will be able to deploy more capable vehicles more quickly and in greater numbers than it currently is able to do. Moving to nuclear deterrent, the air component of China's nuclear triad is the JL-1 air-launched ballistic missile, carried by the H-6N bomber. It has a range of around 8,000 kilometres or 5,000 miles, not including the H-6N's own combat radius. Armed with a hypersonic boost glide vehicle, it has greater manoeuvring capabilities than traditional manoeuvrable re-entry vehicles. The premier land component of China's nuclear triad is the DF-5 Charlie, a liquid fueled silo based system It has a range of around 20,000 kilometres or 12,500 miles and can be armed with 10 multiple independently targeted re-entry vehicles. However, being liquid fueled, it takes longer time to prepare for launch. Another important component of the land based triad is the DF-61. An evolution of the DF-41 it is road mobile and has a range of around 15,000 kilometres or 9,500 miles. Being road mobile and not silo based like the DF-5 Charlie, it is a more survivable system. Also shown at the parade was the DF-26D Intermediate Range Ballistic Missile IRBM. It has a range of around 5,000 kilometres or 3,000 miles with a variable warhead of around 1,500 kilograms or 3,300 pounds which can be conventional or nuclear, and takes the form of a hypersonic glide vehicle. The DF-26D has a terminal speed of Mach 12 to Mach 15 and can be employed against moving targets. But the PLA rocket force also includes cruise missiles. The CJ-1000 is a hypersonic cruise missile designed for long-range precision strike. Flying at above Mach 5, potentially reaching Mach 6 to Mach 7, it has a reported range of 6,000 kilometres or over 3,700 miles and is manoeuvrable. 
It also prevents a different threat profile to other systems approaching the target at lower level than other hypersonic weapons. And finally, space capabilities. 2025 was a record-breaking year for China with 90 orbital launches. Approximately 50 of these have a military-related purpose, including ISR, communications, navigation, meteorology, and on-orbit anti-satellite capabilities. These include close approach and rendezvous operations where they can grab other satellites. In summary, 2025 was one of the most significant years over the past decade or so for developments within the PLA, with indications of what is likely to come over the next few years and clear signs of new capabilities to be fielded in the very near future. Regarding the 2025 US Department of Defense report to Congress, it is best described as a nothing burger in terms of what it contributed by way of PLA capability developments. While it did make mention of certain space-based capabilities, it offered little, if any, substance to discussion on broader PLA developments. Even allowing for who the target audience is for this document, this was a very lightweight product. In terms of what we might see in 2026, for the Navy, confirmation of their nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, Type 076 assault carrier commissioning, more Type 055, 052 Delta Lemmas and 054 Alpha Modifieds commissioning, better images of the new Type 041 Mini SSN, confirmation of construction of the Type 095 SSN and 096 SSBN, better images of the new semi-submersible trimaran vessel, and more developments around commercial arsenal ships. For the Air Force, continued evolution of the JXDS and J36 sixth generation aircraft, KJ3000, AEW and C, and Y15 transport aircraft. Images of the new loyal wingman slash collaborative combat aircraft flying, and perhaps first glimpses of the H20 bomber, or whatever that program might develop into. For ground vehicles, upgraded ZTZ-99 tank, additional variants of the new armoured fighting vehicles, both tracked and wheeled, and more mobile counter UAS system vehicles. And for space capabilities, even more orbital launches with military-related payloads. 2025 was a significant year for developments in the PLA, including a number of surprises. What surprises await us in 2026? That concludes today's briefing. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, like and share, and don't forget to click the notification button so you don't miss the next briefing. You never know what it will be about. Happy to take suggestions for briefings from members. Until next time, far later, Sarah.